Welcome everyone. This is the Edith Harris Lecture from the School of Social Work. The Edith Harris Memorial Lecture has been hosted by the School of Social Work since 1987. Edith Harris was a social work student from 1966 to 68, and her untimely death cut short a very promising social work career. Her husband, Mort Harris, who recently passed away, funded this lecture to be given annually. And each year, there's a different subject that's covered in the Edith Harris lecture. For this year, this is, covers disability justice. And in this um, panel today, you'll hear activists from the Detroit community talk about disability justice. And this ends a three-part series that the School of Social Work has done over the academic year. I think that this is a wonderful ending to this series because it highlights activists in the Detroit community and augments what has been a wonderful outcome of this series is that the students in the School of Social Work have started a new student organization, the Social Work Disability Justice Coalition. And they are focused on empowering social change within the community. And I hope that you'll look in the chat and see more information about this coalition and join and help uh, create some of that social change. I want to introduce our interpreters. We will have two interpreters signing throughout the lecture. This is Laura and she will be joined by Helen and they will switch every 15 minutes. I also want to remind students and those seeking continuing education credits to complete the attendance survey via the link in the chat. Those seeking CEs will receive additional information after the event. Without further ado, I want to get to our panel and I want to introduce the facilitator of our panel, Dr. Sharon Milberger. Dr. Sharon Milberger is the director of the Michigan Disability, um, I'm sorry, Michigan Developmental Disabilities Institute here at Wayne State University. It's Michigan's University Center for Excellence in Developmental Disabilities, Education, Research, and Service for the state. And Dr. Milberger is responsible for statewide education, community support, research and dissemination of programs. She is committed to promoting diversity and cultural competence, and we are thrilled that she'll be here to facilitate and introduce our panelists. So without any further delays, Dr. Milberger. Thank you so much, Dean Kubiak. And um, for that introduction, I am so excited and honored to be here with you all today and with our esteemed panel. Before we get into the program, I'd like just to take a minute or two to shift gears so that we can be fully present for this experience. So for those of you that are interested, I'd like to invite you to practice some deep breathing. So if you're sitting, please plant your feet on the ground and feel free to close your eyes or leave them open. So let's start with a deep breath, breathing in through your nose, and holding for a few seconds and breathing out slowly through your mouth. And let's do another deep breath. And as you're breathing, pay attention to how your body feels. How do your feet feel touching the ground? If you're sitting, how do the back of your legs feel touching the chair? And with each breath, Try to make it a little bit deeper. And as you exhale, relax your body. So relax your shoulders, your arms, your legs. Just relax yourself as much as possible. And let's just do a couple more deep breaths and make them our deepest and most relaxing yet.
And let's come back together and we'll begin the program. So thank you for taking that minute or so to practice some self-care. And with all that's going on in the world, it is so important to practice self-care and to model self-care. So I really appreciate you allowing me to um, practice some deep breathing with you. So thank you very much. And I believe we're going to have our panelists come on. Well, I'm so excited for our wonderful panelists. And what I'm going to do is have you each start off and introduce yourself, say your name, your organization, um, just a brief introduction about yourself and your role at your organization. So I'll call on you based on how I see you. And um, I'm going to have you start with um, Owalabi Aboyade. So if you could start off. Hello, peace and greetings, everyone. Um, thank you so much for having me to be here. I'm Owalabi uh, from Detroit, from the west side of Detroit. Um, my comments and my work is influenced by um, the last 20 years as an environmental uh, and climate justice organizer and cultural organizer here in Detroit. Um, now I am one of the coordinators of the community care circles uh, with Detroit Disability Power and one of the founders of the Relentless Bodies Creative, uh, Creative Collaborative. And also I work in African traditional religion um, to bring wholeness and spirituality um, as I can go about. Um, I'm so excited to be here. Um, to share and also to listen and be in conversation. Thank you. Thank you so much, Awalabi. And I'm gonna pass it off to Amy, Jr. Hello, everyone. Thanks for uh, having me here today. So I'm gonna start by giving you a description of myself. I am a light complected woman with dark rimmed glasses, long dark hair, wearing purple lipstick, a denim jacket, and a black top. Behind me is a picture of a living room that has a brick wall, a white couch, white walls, and a piano, a black piano. Uh, and that's it. I'm Jamie Jr. and I am the community coordinator for the City of Detroit's Office of Disability Affairs. I am a lifelong Detroiter and a disability advocate. Again, thank you for having me today. Thanks, Jamie. And next we have Hala. Um, hello, everybody. Uh, can everyone hear me okay? Uh, just, uh, um, hello, um, my name is Hala Alazawi. I'm a disability advocate and woman of color with a disability. Um, I currently serve as the Michigan Disability Rights Coalition's Religion and Gender Initiatives Coordinator. Um, as um, as a woman of color who identifies as Muslim, um, my research primarily centers around the intersectionality of religion uh, and gender and ethnicity. Um, so that that's kind of what led me to this work. Um, and I'm very thankful to like all the all my fellow disability advocates for introducing me to opportunities like these. Um, I think it's so important to raise awareness around um, what we can do to increase equity for people with disabilities. Uh, speaking of dis um, increasing equity, um, I'm just going to uh, describe my box as, just as Jamie did. Um, I am sitting on a brown couch um, with dark brown hair, um, a, a black blouse with uh, red flowers, with colored flowers. Um, and I have pink rimmed glasses and some makeup on. Um, so that's me. Thank you so much to the School of Social Work for having me. Thank oh, you. and I'm also currently a student of, uh, of social work. I'm pursuing my MSW at the University of Michigan, Ann Arbor. Excellent. Thank you, Hala. And mm -hmm. last but not least is Tamika. Hello, uh, thank you for uh, inviting me. Um, I'll give my description of myself as well. I am a brown skin, a woman with a long black hair. I'm wearing a red lipstick and my 
um, I'm wearing a brown sweater and there's some peak patterns in it and there's a white uh, background uh, behind me. Um, I am a disability justice activist and also um, independent um, film producer and screenwriter. Um, I do uh, many different things. I've been advocating over 15 years for uh, people with disabilities, health equity, uh, voting oppression towards people with disabilities, uh, racial injustices, gender injustices, and uh, criminal justice as well. Um, and I volunteer for uh, Warriors on Wheels, a uh, metropolitan uh, Detroit. So I'm really excited to be here today. Great. Thank you all. And wow, what an impressive group. I'm so excited to hear, hear more from you all. Before we have you talk a little bit more, we wanted to get a sense of the audience and what your experience is with disability. And I believe in the chat, there will be a poll asking about your experience with disability. I don't know if I can see that or not. But if you could fill out that poll. It's posted. And I if it, I don't know if it says on it, but you can check more than one. If it doesn't say that, you can check more than one. So we'll just give a moment for that. Another moment here and then we'll find out who's in the audience. And we'll find out how big our audience is. We need some hold music. All right. So again, this is going to add up to more than 100% because um, you all could add more than one ex experience. So 55% of you um, are professionals. 45% are, are people with disabilities. 25% family members, and 10% um, is none of the above. So that's, I think that's a really, um, I, you know, it's great to know with the audience, there's a lot of lived experience, direct lived experience, whether it's a person with disability or family member or professional experience. So um, thank you, audience, for, for filling that out. That's very helpful. So what I'd like to do now is um, learn a little bit more. So we've heard a lot of terms, um, disability rights, disability justice, disability pride, and more. I, and I'm sure in today's conversation, we'll be using a lot of different terms. But wanted to get a sense from each of you, what does disability justice mean to you? And what was your path into disability justice work? So I'm going to mix it up a little bit, and I'm going to have Tamika start first. Um, yes, I, I really, I believe um, your disability justice is really speaks my language uh, of all the, the uh, different movements of the past, in particular because a disability justice really recognizes uh, the multiple identities that people with disabilities have, which I mean by you know, I'm, of course, I'm a person with a disability, but then also I'm a woman. I'm also uh, a black, you know, person, I'm African American, and so you know, I don't have to leave my other identities at the door, or I have to leave my other identities when it comes to advocating. Um, one of the things I've learned in disability justice is everything is interconnected. So you know, when you advocate 
disability justice, you're also advocating for racial justice, for gender justice, for all different types of justices because everything is interconnected. And so um, that is why I use the title disability justice. Um, if you see like on my LinkedIn, I do use that as my actual title. Uh, because when I'm advocating and when I show up in a room, I'm advocating as my whole self. And I recognize, um, you know, the identities and the diversity of all, you know, people. Um, and the way I got into this work, um, the whole disability world, was through um, Miss Wheelchair Michigan um, competition. Uh, that's where I met, uh, for the first time, women uh, with disabilities, women with um, in wheelchairs in particular. And so um, from that point on, I never, you know, left the community. And it is a beautiful, beautiful community to be part of. Thank you, Tamika. I'm going to uh, have Hala go next. Um, yes. So uh, to add to my colleague Tamika, I also believe in the complexity of intersectional identities and kind of thinking about identities as being interconnected um, rather than just being separate. So me, like I'm a Muslim with an, you know, with an Arab American identity and a physical disability. So I can't just leave like one part of my identity at the door. Um, as Tamika mentioned, I think we, we need to accept and we need to just create an equitable space for everyone who comes with, you know, a set of identities. And, you know, because you know, we all, we're all complex beings, but we all learn from each other and we all grow from each other. And the way that we can create an equitable world and a just world is by learning from each other and collaborating with each other and recognizing each other's experiences and recognizing the complexity of those experiences. So on a structural level, disability justice to me means recognizing that on a structural level, this, this world was not built for people with disabilities. So like I said, we need to collaborate um, and just build on each other's experiences to create a more accessible world for, for everyone, for people of cognitive disabilities, uh, for people who have physical disabilities, for people who have visual disabilities. And I think by building on that, we can create a more just and equitable society. Um, so that's pretty much what disability justice means to me. Um, and as for my path into disability, I'd actually like to thank um, my colleague and my friend and my mentor, Tamika Sitchins Bruce. Um, I pretty much got into disability advocacy through Healthy Dearborn. Um, when a professor of mine uh, at U of M um, in, like kind of uh, assigned us this assignment to um, an assi a specific assignment to advance social justice and social change for a cause that we're passionate about. And I told her I was passionate about disability justice. And she led me to Healthy Dearborn. And Healthy Dearborn, like Tamika, just opened up so many doors for me specifically. And it just kind of snowballed from there. And I, I kind of she, she helped me like open doors for speaking engagements and advocacy. And she really helped me come into myself and, and accept myself, you know, as I am. So I really want to thank her. Thank you, Hala. You're welcome. O Olabi, if you could tell us your, what disability justice means to you and your path into this work. Thank you very much. Um, I'm Owalabi. Um, a brief visual description of myself is I am a um, brown skinned African man um, with glasses and Afro mustache and a beard on both sides of my face and a blue long sleeve t-shirt um, with a few books on a shelf in my background, um, various shelves in the background. And for me, disability justice has been a journey I used to be able to count on one hand um, the number of people who knew that I had kidney failure. Um, it was something that I've been working with this uh, since 1990. Um, disability justice helped me to uh, politicize my health status. Um, I think about in particular um, talks with Dessa Cosma 
and Diana Seals, um, who have um, pushed me and helped me to think about both communication and what does it mean to have a politicized health status. Um, I started by connecting with people who had chronic illnesses as well as invisible illnesses, as that was uh, most closely to my life experience. Um, and also mental illness was tangentially uh, related to some experiences as well. Um, and the thing that really caught me about disability justice was as I got to know the work of Leah Lakshmi Piepsa Samarinsa, um, and that's about providing care for each other. Um, that's about people, um, as Hala mentioned, in a world that is um, incompatible, in a world that can be inaccessible, um, what's, the, what's the action of listening and what's the action of providing care for each other? And that work really um, caught me and really got me um, going. And then lastly, um, as somebody who worked in environmental justice, um, we see that because of pollution, because of race, because of class, because of economics, this society creates disabilities, you know, via pollution, via neglect, via violence. You know, I remember there were some brothers who were in a wheelchair group for um, people who had been um, caught up in gun violence, you know, and they had a wheelchair group and a disability support group. And so this violent, a uh, neglectful society creates disabilities as part of its injustice. And that really kind of caught my attention. Um, and how do we heal our relationship to the environment when we're in this environment that's creating these cancers and asthmas and, you know, neurological things, you know? Um, so that that's an aspect of disability justice that really caught my attention. Um, and then how to confront the ableism from organizers who may be organizing in those lines, but don't speak to the people that have those illnesses or don't have the accommodations, you know, when people do have those illnesses. So that also caught my attention. Thank you, Olalabi. And Jamie. Well, so finally, first of all, let me say, I agree with everything that everyone here has said. Um, my definition of disability justice really starts with the fact that I see disability not as a diagnosis or a condition, but really more of a culture or a way of being because disability to me means that my body is meeting a world that's not built for me. And that's where the disability sets in. Um, and that can be in, environments such as attitudes, systems, built environment, equity, and the whole nine yards. So my path to becoming a disability justice advocate or, or uh, activist um, really started with my presence in certain places because for a long time, I was the only one or the first one who had a very visible disability and a specific need for accommodation in many other jobs or schools or spaces that I was in. So it really started with me creating the access that I needed for myself. And then as I started to do that, what I found was other people would say, yeah, I have that need too, or yeah, that makes a lot of sense. So, um, and then about three, maybe four years ago, I, like Holla, met uh, Tamika and Lisa Franklin of Warriors on Wheels and a couple other people. And I found acceptance. And I found that it was okay that I was having all these difficulties. But the other thing that I found was that if... I could be true to my identity, bring my whole self as a black woman who uses a mobility device and is a mother. I can bring my whole self to this movement to create community and equity and inclusion for everybody. So that's where I really landed me in these spaces. 
Thank you, Jamie. And we're gonna um, continue with some questions and we're gonna have some dialogue across the panelists. But before I realized that I did not give a visual description of myself. So I am a white woman, uh, fairly fair skinned. I have shoulder length, straight gray hair. I have glasses with, a, with black frames. I am in, I'm wearing a black V-neck long sleeve shirt. I'm in my home office. The walls are white. There's a ceiling fan, some shelves behind me with a bunch of stuff on it. And I have a bulletin board to, to my right with some papers on it. So we're going to continue with our questions. So um, we, um, I, this one is for you, Jamie. And how is the work of disability justice unique in Detroit? And how is it similar and different from what's going on in other parts of the country and globally? And Jamie, if you can kick us off and then other panelists would love to hear your thoughts as well. So why don't you kick us off, Jamie? Uh, so from my purview, I'll say that because Detroit happens to be one of the largest black cities, mostly black cities in the country, I think our disability justice movement here is really steeped in racial equity and justice um, and the things that go along, along with that economic justice, uh, housing justice, transportation justice. So we have really integrated ourselves into what it means to be a person living in a city that has marginalized people of color and how disability comes from that. Um, in terms of how it's similar or different, I think in a lot of ways it's similar to other areas of the world because people, people of like minds generally come together and advocate. They build movements around similar issues. But I have to say, I have not been to many different places throughout the world to know other advocates. So maybe my colleagues can speak to that more. Would anyone else like to weigh in on this? And thank you, Jamie, for kicking us off on this. So what's unique about Detroit, uh, the disability justice movement in Detroit and what, what's similar or different from across the country or globally? Um, so I can chime in. Um, I, I agree with JB that, you know, with Detroit being predominantly um, African American and then with uh, Southeastern Michigan being, you know, very uh, diverse in the region, uh, especially compared to others, you know, parts of Michigan or other parts of uh, the country, it is um, really ingrained in racial equity, so I definitely um, signed off what to, to what JB said. Also for um, many of the founders of the disability justice movement are uh, people of color and they are, um, they, they started in Berkeley, California. And so, uh, you know, so you have those similarities that it really, when they created it, it really was the purpose was to, you know, uh, create a new framework for people uh, with disabilities to work from. Um, because like the prior movements uh, before disability justice movement wasn't very inclusive um, at all. So it is, you know, like a an extension or 2.0 uh, based on what you can say um, when it comes to disability movements um, in this country. And um, so I say that that was, that's what stood out to me the most of the similarities and yet the differences with particularly here in Detroit area. Yes, I think this is an exciting time for disability justice in Detroit. I think that for most people, if you Google disability justice, you hear or you'll find a lot of texts and voices from the West Coast, maybe voices from the East Coast, you know, as Tamika mentioned, who kind of laid this groundwork. So it's a very exciting time 
um, for folks in Detroit, for us in Detroit, to kind of um, share our experiences, share this cross movement um, ideas that are being put off. And it's also a lot, uh, I think there's a lot of things that don't have as many resources. I think that some of the stuff in other places um, have, you know, more resources, bigger shows and different things like entertainment and, you know, different things like that. And so I think that um, the re disability justice in Detroit doesn't have as many resources it has it's similar to a lot of other places, but not some of the places that'll come when you first Google or when you, you know, first look up disability justice. And so I think it's an exciting time for us to be in dialogue with each other and for us to be, you know, moving this forward here in Detroit. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Jeff, you want to I'm just wondering how much do your organizations, how much do you have, I mean, I don't know if you're representing, you know, a small number of organizations, but how much do you interact with each other? What is the larger disability justice community in Detroit like? Well, I would say, I know that myself, I started um, my main corporate advocacy journey with Warriors on Wheels. So obviously I work with or, or Warriors on Wheels. We've done a lot of work with uh, Detroit Disability Power. Uh, one of my former life trainings in disability pride and justice came through Michigan Disability Rights Coalition. So I would say that um, the groups here are really interconnected, but at the same time, we're kind of siloed because people have different interests, sub-interests. So you have an organization that is focused on disability justice as part of environmental justice. And maybe you'll have people that are working on it as a function of economic justice or racial equity. So we have our silos, but for the most part, I think we all are interconnected. I don't know if my colleagues would agree. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, we it's it's, it's a uh, it's a small community, but I would say a mighty community. Yeah. You know, uh, you know, yeah. we all work together and everything, and and, and it's different because I've been involved in disability since like two thousand and six. So it's been interesting to see like the changes, you know, of the people. Mm -hmm. Certain people have, you know, um, passed on. So and and I saw what the fights were, uh, especially among uh, the disability community in two thousand six, two thousand seven. And so, um, unfortunately, many of the fights are still there. Um, but it's just interesting from hindsight seeing the changes of the people, but continuing, you know, the fight. I definitely second what Tamika and Jamie talked about. Um, I'm like relatively new compared to Tamika and Jamie, so I'm learning from them. Like you all are my mentors. So I, I started in 2018 with Healthy Dearborn's Inclusive Health Committee um, it was basically a committee that advocated for healthy lifestyles for people with disabilities. And so I just, I learned so much from this diverse community here in Detroit. And I've also been in a cohort uh, with the Michigan Disability Rights Coalition as well. And I just feel like, you know, that one connection with Tamika just like, you know, just sprouted into so many other beautiful connections with Detroit Disability Power. And, um, you know, the MDRC, obviously, and, and just so many other wonderful organizations. And I think, again, that, that kind of theme of learning from each other and building from each other and, like, actively finding connections and seeing, like, people that, you know, building on each other's meaningful dialogue and seeing that people have the same passion as you, like, that passion can grow and sprout into a beautiful thing to the point where we're able to advance equity for the disability population. So I really want to thank all the people here. Like, I know I'm being redundant, but like, I'm really thankful for all of you. 
you know, it's, I think you raise a really good point, Hala, in that, you know, I think part of being an activist and what I hear from the four of you is that you're connectors. So you're looking for ways to break down those silos, yeah. connect and work jointly. I'd like to ask a, kind of a follow-up question to this. And this is, if you can kick us off, um, Owalabi, how do race and um, class affect experiences of disability in Detroit? And are there examples of this beyond the black-white dichotomy that panelists can speak to? Yes, thank you. Um, I'll say a little bit, and I'm excited to hear um, if others um, want to share their experiences as well. But um, in our work with the care circles and seeing what care means, we see that race and class um, affects so many different things. Because as people are mentioning, race and class affects how people are treated by institutions. You know, yes, yes, disability does affect how people are treated, but also race and class affects, you know, how likely are people to be dismissed? How likely are people to be believed? How likely are people to not be believed? Um, you know, all of these different things and so when people are sharing their life experience, you know, and somebody is presenting these negative experiences or disrespecting or, you know, not believing, it's not like they tell you, oh, I'm doing this because of, you know, because you have a disability or I'm doing this for this one reason. You know, it's as people are, as you know, everybody on the panel is mentioning, you know, that intersectionality, um, affects those type of exclusions and oppressions and neglects. Um, and also race and class affects where people live, you know, which relates to pollution, which relates to toxicity, which relates to having access to the institutions. You know, some people can take for granted that, oh, my local institutions are gonna support me. You know, whether that's schools or whether that's places where you can go get assistance and other people, you know, thinking of some different stories that I've heard in which because of poverty, you go to this institution for help. And it's a coin toss if you're really gonna get helped or if you're just gonna get disrespected. Um, and so I think those are some of the things. And then lastly about um, different cultures, other cultures besides um, the African community, besides the white community, there are different cultural norms, You know, a variety of cultural norms, communication, uh, relationship to work, and those can affect how people are treated, how people are believed or not believed, or how people are ignored, or those different types of things. And if the assumption is that the customer or the client is a white male, you know, and that's how they base their accommodations, then a whole bunch of people are going to be left out of those accommodations. Excuse me, if the assumption is a white disabled male, then that's still going to leave a whole bunch of people out. Um, because of the, you know, our different cultures. So that's. What do others want to share? Go ahead, Jamie. Um, I was actually going to say that maybe uh, Hannah would be a wonderful person to speak to this question, given her work with uh, racial equity and religion. But I would say, yeah, I'll turn it over to Hala because I think she can really shed some light on this conversation. Oh, well, thank you, Jamie. So for me, I think the social determinants of health um, definitely matter. Um, like, so where people live, work, and play, like, affects um you know the structure of like care and like what they the resources that they receive access to um so like i'm gonna, i'm going to give an example of like for an example a uh, arab american immigrant who for example might have a physical disability um who might not be like might not know where to start or where to begin in terms of accessing resources for people with disabilities. Like if they don't know the language or if they're new to, um, you know, or if they're not sure on how to access resources, this can be very, very, like this can hinder their access to quality of care, right? So um, 
this way, especially if, like, for example, if the person is low SES, they might not have, like, access to, like, equitable transportation, right? Or they might not be able to, like, you know, pay to, to get their own, you know, transportation. So it, it just, it, it really, really, like, this kind of, like, intersection of race and class depending on like how resources are structured in society and how power is defined and how who gets what is defined can hinder uh definitely like access to resources for people who are of color who, who you know came to this country recently and don't really know where to begin so that can perpetuate a lot of inequity um, I don't know if that answers the question very well, but I, I'm hoping that that did it. <laughs> if anyone wants to add, please feel free. Well, I, I would like to uh, just lift up a point that Hala mentioned about language. Mm -hmm. So often in the conversation about disability justice, we consider making things accessible physically, maybe for people who um, are hearing it, who are deaf or who are blind, but we don't often consider people who are undocumented immigrants from other countries, people who English is a second language for. And I think that that, along with other things, as a, another complex layer of oppression. Because if you can't speak the language, mm -hmm. if you're not familiar with the surroundings, mm -hmm. you can't access mm -hmm. what you need and you can't even access community. So I think that even adds to isolation. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Like definitely low social support is definitely um, a compounded like sort of oppression particularly when like even in like your within your own community for example if you're an immigrant and disability is already stigmatized within your community it can also like feel like doubly isolating in a way um or like the isolation can kind of compound because you know like you can't really turn to you know the you know non-immigrant community for example because you don't know where to start and then for your own community if disability is stigmatized then there's not really a way to um kind of form that social support then it can be very overwhelming and 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 very just isolating yeah, yeah, I definitely would like to say um second that is it is a different dichotomy. That's that's for certain. When you, you know, experience life and you know, from a race and disability and other, you know, social factors and sometimes you don't know, you know, where it's coming from. Like, you know, are they doing this to me because you know I'm black, it's because you know I'm, I'm disabled, it's because I'm a woman or this and that, the other. So it is like a rare, you know, dichotomy uh, that does take place. Mm. This is, and I see you're shaking your head, Olabi. Oh, um, I, you know, I think this might be a good place just to pause for a moment. And I'd love for the audience and even for the panelists just to pause for a minute and reflect on what's standing out for you what's what are you feeling what are you thinking and for for those in the audience if you would be willing to maybe share a thought or two um in the chat i don't know if i'll be able to see the chat but perhaps someone could provide me with some information if anyone puts anything in the chat so just pause and reflect if you want to stretch for a minute I don't know if I'll see any of the comments, but you know, I hope that you're sharing amongst yourselves and, and hopefully some things are standing out for you. Um, what I'd like to do now is do a, um, another poll. 
So if, um, which is getting at um, just reflecting on your own thinking and bias. And the question is, um, what, how familiar are you with the concept of ableism? And if you could just let me know when that poll is posted, when the question is posted. Okay, so it should be posted. And if you could take a second and share how familiar you are with the concept of ableism. And while we're waiting for that, you can be reflecting on what's standing out for you, any ahas, prizes. And if again, if you'd like to share that in the um, in the comments, that'd be great. Another few seconds till we get the full results. Okay, so 12% have never heard of it before. 15% have heard of the term. 8% have read something about it. 62% know a lot and 4% of you could teach a course on it. So um, that's very helpful to know. So we're gonna spend the next bit of our conversation talking about ableism. And I believe with the materials um, related to the program, ableism is defined as the faulty assumption that people with disabilities are not as important or as valuable as people without disabilities. And in the words of Haben Gurma, the um, disability justice activist and attorney, many of you are familiar with her, she says ableism is the primary issue for advocates. So I'm going to direct this question to you, Hala. How can social workers, mm -hmm. whether they're working in schools, foster care, or criminal justice, to, justice systems, support disability justice in those settings and in other settings? Um, yes, thank you. So um, I think as social workers, um, we need to reflect on our own personal biases through the concept of paraxis, which means like reflecting on your internalized biases, you know, coming in from the micro level, which is the individual level when working with a client on one on one. And Again, I'm sorry, like I'm not trying to like tell social workers what to do. Like this is just from my own learning, like as a social worker thus far um, or as a student of social work. Um, so I just want to say that I recommend as a person of disability, as a person, you know, of this of a student of social. Well, sorry, <laughs> as a student of social work, that people who are doing macro one-on-one -on -one. look at disability in a way where they reflect on their own biases about disability first and then and then you know interact with a client and you know with all clients in a way that is accessible to them and in a way that just in a way that centers their needs first because i think a lot of the concern in the disability community is that, you know, people like constantly like our able-bodied counterparts may think that, oh, you know, this is what's best for the person, right? Or this is what's best for the person with a disability. They might like, in trying to help, they actually assume. So instead of like assuming or rather than trying to assume what the person with a disability needs. So like, for example, if they have a cognitive disability, take the time to actually explain to them in detail you know what you know what you would recommend you know what you would recommend and kind of collaborate together use collaborative language when when actually like formulating a treatment plan and 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 let them take the lead whether that means like you explaining like more than once to a person with a cognitive disability or having like 
you know, resources with large letters for people with visual visual disabilities. Or even like, you know, even with a physical disability, like just making your exam room or your, I don't want to say exam room, uh, your, you know, your rooms accessible, your building, making sure that it's accessible and making sure that it's familiar and making sure that it's comfortable, you know, for people. And so on a meso level, which means like on an organizational level, I recommend that as social workers, we ensure that the organizations that we partner with are also advocating for inclusive policies for people with disabilities. Because it's it's super important that we we stay interconnected through you know through our organizations and through our partnerships so that we can learn and collaborate and build off of each other's um knowledge and and expertise around disability there might be an or, an organization for people with disabilities that you know focuses on people of color for example that you know your organization as a social work you know as a social work organization might not be familiar with so it's good to collaborate with each other on a meso level to ensure that people, you know, that people with disabilities have the best quality of care possible. On a macro level, um, if you're doing like more macro work and policy work, um, you know, I would suggest maybe writing like policy memos, you know, to the National Association of Social Workers or like writing a policy memo to your congressman about like a certain structural issue or a certain like you know if if we're talking about like physical issues we could talk about like the uneven cracks in the parking lot for example we could talk about how that's problematic or we could talk about how there's not enough resources in braille and how we'd like to see more resources in braille in our in our institutions right so i think you know just learning and reflecting through this this concept of paraxis and just you know eliminating internalized biases as much as you can about people with disabilities and centering their needs and centering their voices in their treatment plan can go so far you know can go a very long way so i hope that answers the question i'm sorry that was long <laughs> No, that was great. And it's always good to ask the social work student to, to answer that question. I, I'm curious with the panelists, uh, other panelists, anything you'd like to add? That was really excellent and comprehensive, Paula. Any any other um, thing that any of you would like to share or add or amplify? Uh, this is Jamie. So one thing that I would say, first of all, I agree with everything that Holla has said, but I also would say that making sure that in institutions such as the School of Social Work or other uh, educational institutions or programming institutions, ensure that you have people with disabilities at the table helping to lead the lead and facilitate conversations. That's the most important advice. I think the best way to remove any form of ableism or implicit bias is to create opportunities for people to be in community because they're less likely to discriminate against me if you see me as a friend or a colleague than just someone on the street. Mm -hmm. And that's not to excuse the person that only sees me as someone on the street, but you tend to see your neighbor, you see that treat my neighbor as myself type thing and it becomes more of a practice I think I hope I didn't confuse anything. That is an important addition, Jamie. Thank you. Oh, well, I wholeheartedly agree with Jamie. I saw you shaking your head adamantly there. Yes. Yes, <laughs> yes I, I think that um, for institutions and decision makers and educational institutions, um, Hala and Jamie um, hit so much right on the mark. Um, I just want to share a story which has a slightly different angle um, from my life experience, actually back in Ann Arbor. Um, and it's in, now I see T.L. Lewis talks about ableism as a system that places value on people's bodies and minds 
based on ideas of normalcy, intelligence, and excellence. And the short story that I have is um, when I was in school in Ann Arbor, a friend of mine was training to be a teacher and they invited me to come spend the day talking to all their different you know, classes at the school. And um, this was a, um, I can't remember if it was a middle school or high school, so I started the day and went to all the different classes and went to some quote unquote regular classes and went to some quote unquote honor classes, went to these different classes. And I was like, oh, this is interesting. And being who I am, you know, from Detroit, I always have a racial lens. I'm like, oh, there's not very many black people at this school. That's very interesting. I guess that's how Ann Arbor is, you know. But then at the end of the day, they just how the schedule worked out, the last two periods were the quote unquote special education classes. And those classes were jam packed with Africans, jam packed with black students, you know, in the city of Ann Arbor. And it was like, whoa, you know, what's going on here? And so I think that sometimes this level, this notion of measuring up, this notion of intelligence, this notion of what can you do, what's normal, what's not normal, you're normal. Sometimes that's used as a weapon against our community, you know, in different ways. Um, and for some people, you know, disability can be empowering and it can help answer questions. And in other people, it can be used like you're different. You're not smart. You're not this. You can't sit still. You know, you're, there's something wrong with you. Um, and it's not used in a way that brings people support you know, is used as a way that tells people that there's something wrong with them. And I think that some institutions, so I think that all the social workers and all the people should take a look at the institutions that they're in, you know, because some institutions have systemic racism, systemic ableism, systemic sexism, you know what I mean, in their institutions. So what are you going to do about it? And that really blew my mind. Like I literally had the thought, oh, there's no black students in this school, you know, and they had been all put, you know, in these particular classes, the, what they call it, the special education. I don't know, they may have a different name now, but they were all put at the end of the day. Um, so that's the little story that I'll share um, about ableism. And, you know, thank you for sharing that story, Olavi. And I think this kind of tees it up nicely for the next question, which um, Tamika, I'm, I'm hoping you'll kick us off with this one. Um, how can social workers get in touch with their own ableism? And what is the role of higher ed in raising the consciousness of ableism? And then you brought up another piece too about when you are working or in an environment where there's systemic ableism. So off to you, Tamika. Yeah, um, so I see it as, you know, um, how you would approach, um, you know, a racial implicit, Biases. So I would say the way that people can, you know, check their own ableism per se is like what is the first thought that comes to your head? And you have to be really conscious of it. But what is your first, you know, thought that comes to your head when you see somebody, you know, with a physical disability? Like what's the most immediate thought, you know, that's unfiltered, you know? Um, and if you listen to that and if you see that, then, you know, nine times out of ten, it's going to make you feel uncomfortable, but then it's going to make you aware. Uh, because when we look at society, you know, just as how we uh, perceive race, there are different racial, um, you know, stereotypes that exist. And, you know, we would like to think that we don't drink the Kool-Aid, but we do, you know, we do because it's in our media, it's on our music, it's now it's in, on the internet, you know, it's all these stereotypes of what supposed, what people, you know, of different races are supposed to be. So I, I see that as similar to disability. If we look at the historical stereotypes of people with disabilities, that comes to, you know, that people with disabilities are, uh, you know, weak or they dependent or, you know, all people with physical disabilities that have experienced this myself. Oh, you have a physical disability. So that must be that you have a cognitive disability as well. Um, you know, you must be poor. I could count, you know, 
on my figures, you know, it's like how many times people have walked up to me and given me money, you know, when I never asked for it, but they, you know, gave me $20, $50. One person gave me a hundred, the other person gave me a dollar. So, you know, so people have these stereotypes that they think that people, you know, people with disabilities, especially when you have a physical disability, you know, but even if you have an invisible disability, you know, there's stereotypes of that, like, oh, you know, you're not really disabled and you must be faking it. And, you know what I'm saying? So there are so many, you know, stereotypes. So we have to, as a society, you know, and people who are in social work really begin to, you know, not say, oh, I don't see disability or, you know, but really critically think, you know, when you see somebody, you know, rolling down the street, you know, what is your first thought? And then, then, then you can uh, take it uh, from there. Um, and then what can schools do? Um, I would say or higher education definitely um, do have different webinars such as this, uh, you know, going to uh, teachers and you know, to various different sectors on disability justice. Um, there was one time uh, through the Michigan Disability Rights Coalition that I did do a whole day, you know, seminar on disability justice. I think it was with you, JB, yeah, and everything. So that was really good because, you know, we gave through the history of people with disabilities, uh, you know, we talked about different scenarios. We talked about disability justice, how it applies. So that's what I would say higher education can do is to have more topics of disability justice to their students. Yeah, uh, if I may, I would just like to point out that Wayne State offers a wonderful program. So my DDI is a wonderful opportunity for professionals in the medical field, social work field, to learn alongside disability justice advocates. I was actually, I'm actually a graduate of the program and it was a wonderful opportunity for me to share my experiences as a person with direct lived experience. And then you have other professionals who have, who are family members or, you know, parents, siblings that have a relative experience with disability sharing and learning so i learn from them just like they learn from me that's one thing that folks can do take advantage of those types of programs the other thing that i can't stress enough is if universities and higher edu institutions of higher education have programs like disability studies they're all the rage now have individuals with disabilities as co-teachers, co-leads, and co-facilitators in those programs because often our stories are written by someone who only has theoretical and book knowledge of what it means to live in our shoes. So that further builds the idea of ableism. And really, so ableism is more than just the favor of individuals who are able by over there is a such thing as ableism also stretches that you think it has to look a certain way right there was a story on instagram or something a while back about a young woman she was an athlete driving her car she had prosthesis so from the top down you couldn't tell that she was a person with the disability she was in a parking lot. She parked the car and there was someone else, another couple. I think they were an older couple. Maybe one of them had a physical disability. They were also waiting for the spot. And because she pulled into the spot, was able to get out of the car and walk, the people actually followed her and made negative comments behind her in the store because she didn't look like she had a disability. So that goes back to, to Mika's point. What does disability look like? That's also, you know, implicit bias and ableism because 
I have to look downtrodden. I have to look disparaged. I have to look a certain way in order for you to identify with the fact that I have a need. So we should be examining all the ways that ableism shows up in our society with our language, using using terms like I heard someone say, and they didn't mean any harm. Not everybody's like a you now. We all have ten, 10 different things going at one time. Now, the person who said it wasn't thinking that they were being ableist, but this was an ableist statement because ADD or ADHD or those types of things are clinical conditions that deserve attention and do not deserve to be trivialized. So I think we really have to check how we envision, refer to, examine, and facilitate conversations about disability. Thank you so much. For, you know, really, my, you know, a lot of thoughts going on in my own mind. I think this is another good spot just to pause for a moment, reflect, panelists as well, uh, participants, just to think about what's standing out for you. Again, if you want to share in the chat or if you want to put questions for, you know, we'll have time for Q&A. So really just pause and think because it's a lot really thought provoking and really important information. So I wanna make sure we allow a moment for reflection. And what I'd like to do now, and so we're gonna, uh, we have about eight more minutes for this part of our of, of the panel discussion is um, panelists, if you wanna share either what's standing out for you and maybe a takeaway or a closing thought you'd like to share, or even just so we could have a little conversation here in our remaining time together. So I don't know, I don't want to put anyone on the spot, but if anyone wants to share something, then we can discuss it, or if everyone wants to share whatever works, whatever you'd like. Um, well, first of all, I, I just want to affirm what Jamie said previously and Tamika said previously about just the way that disability looks i think it's easy for us like specifically to like also internalize the ableist societal messages that we get <laughs> and so like it's easy for us to kind of like just reflect on ourselves like or just inaccurately reflect on ourselves i guess and go like oh well what if i am helpless what if i you know, what if I don't have what it takes to make it, you know, in higher education, for example, you know, because all of these kind of messages that we get, whether through the media, whether through society, whether through family, whether through friends, they really like influence just and shape the way that we see ourselves. And so, you know, I, I just want to say that, like, you know, internalized ableism is also very real. And that, like, we can also, as individuals with disabilities and disability advocates, reflect on, you know, those, you know, ableist thoughts that we may have and just kind of, like, you know, lean on each other for support as a community. Um, and, and, you know, just kind of, you know, like, validate each other's pain and each other's struggle, but also uplift each other. and and see, you know, and see each other in the best light possible. Because we, again, we all have something valuable to bring to the table. And whether we have a visible or invisible disability, that, you know, our, our complexity and our, our beauty is, you know, something that we all bring to the table. So I just wanted to affirm that. Um, I would say, also, uh, with this discussion, as I encourage people to look um, at the disability justice principles, because when you look at the principles, it totally changes the way you know you view the world. I mean, there's things like inter interdependence, because there's nothing wrong with 
saying that you need help. And even I get that sometimes I'm like, I'm so independent. I don't want anybody to think that I'm, you know, helpless or, you know, so even I get caught up in that thinking sometimes, but it's okay to ask for help, you know? Um, so it's, it's creating that community of inter interdependence. And because uh, we all need community, we all need help. Um, like the uh, cross movement work, you know, cross um, disability work. Um, I think that is um, another um, very important principle. Another principle I really love is that everyone has value and your value isn't dependent on how much productivity that you have. You know what I'm saying? Because we caught up in this system that, you know, you gotta work and you you gotta do things and your 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 value is based mm -hmm. upon what you do, you know what I'm saying? Or that you have to that you work. And so if you can't work then you don't have any value. Or if you can't do anything physically then you don't have any value. That's not true, you know, we all, and I really believe that too, we all have a purpose and we all, mm -hmm. all life has value. And so I definitely recommend uh, people check it out. Um, you can Google it, uh, you know, Display Justice Principles. And like I said, it would definitely change your perspective on things. I agree, Tamika. I was like over here jumping up and down internally because I was thinking about interdependence. As a society, people want to be so independent, independent. But the way that I often put it is I may drive a car, but I didn't build the road. I can never build the road that I drive on. Somebody else's contribution made it. And the other thing that I reflect upon during this conversation is the place that self-advocacy has at the table. Mm -hmm. Because it, it stretches beyond me having my thoughts if my voice isn't present. So advocacy, mm -hmm. self-advocacy, we tend to think of self-advocacy as all I'm doing is standing up for myself. Mm -hmm. But it's bringing to light issues. Having these conversations is a form of advocacy because we're bringing awareness to a need, to a goal, to a common goal, to a common cause that needs attention. So those, that's what really comes to mind for me. Um, what's coming to mind for me, I think that each person, Jamie, Hala, Tamika has said this in their own way, it's a form of ableism to think that disability is only oppression. Um, there's so much leadership, you know what I'm saying? There's so much community. Um, that's part of what we do with the community care circle is how we support and how we encourage each other. But I just learned so much about how warriors on wheels and how, you know, that's a big part, people supporting each other, people nurturing each other, people looking out for each other and helping give opportunities to each other, you know, um, furthermore for anybody else doing an events, you know, like these folks here, Tamika, Hala, Jamie, if you're doing an event on organizing, it doesn't have to be about disability. You know what I'm saying? Like bring in, make it accessible. Um, these organizers here, when you listen and understand what they're doing, can be on any panel, can be on any conversation, you know, not just disability organizing. Um, I wanna give, you know, a shout out to um, Tara Ne Fazelli and Aiko Fukuchi. Um, we didn't talk about disability and creativity, you know, Detroit has disability arts, dis disabled artists, you know, look out that, put that in the program, put that in the events. Um, and so, there's a lot of things other than just, you know, advocating against oppression. Um, there's a lot of contributions. There's a lot of, Jamie talked about the culture. There's a lot of culture. There's a lot of beauty. There's a lot of work. And I hope you all could see it and feel it. I could feel it, you know what I'm saying, from the panelists. So I just wanted to make that explicit, you know? You're on mute.
Thank you. I was going to say, oh, Alabi, you do such a nice job of kind of uh, really wrapping up this section on a high note, but also it's you know a good segue because we are we have the privilege now of hearing a spoken word presentation from Oalabi Aboyade. And I'm going to read your little blurb here, Oalabi. So you, he, Oalabi Aboyade is the coordinator of community care circles with Detroit Disability Power and a multidimensional cultural worker from Detroit, we'll see. He is a co-founder of Relentless Bodies, a Detroit-based creative disability and healing justice collective. He has been negotiating kidney failure since 1990. His leadership style emphasizes facilitation, creativity, and spiritual growth. He brings 20 years of cultural facilitation and organization practice against modes of colonization, making soundtracks of resistance that touch mind, body, and spirit. He is the voice of justice anthems such as Day-to-Day -day Struggle, Take Back, Take the House Back, and Water Power. And his music is available at um, willseemusic.bandcamp.com. So we could probably get that written in the chat if, if you didn't catch that. So I'm gonna turn it over to you, Olabi, for your spoken word presentation. Thank you so much um, for the introduction. Again, thanks to all the panelists. Thanks um, to Mika, Hala, Jamie for sharing space with me, um, Wayne State for hosting us. This piece here is called Respiration, um, and it comes out of my work with the environmental situation in Detroit, um, the environmental situation which has caused a lot of pain, which has caused a lot of uh, chronic illness in the city of Detroit. And respiration is all about how we breathe. So we breathe in, we breathe out. We breathe, if we were live in person and I'd do the call and response and everybody would say, breathe out, you know, it'd be all hype. But we're doing it Zoom style for today. Breathe in, breathe out. Breathe in, breathe out. We breathe in hail vapors and dark clouds to shine. Breathe out factory smoke retraces the skyline. It's high time somebody writes rhymes for respiration, a desperate mess we're facing, a stressful situation. Breathe in incinerator smoke, keep your own distance. Breathe outdoor shallow breath, choke car emissions. Breathe <coughs> gas for breath in urban passages. Just to breathe can be a cancer threat. Shattered glass, fragments dance, ever smell shrapnel. That smell lasts just until you leave the Southwest. People who never been in this hood may doubt this. These companies dump waste in the sewer grates. Little children play in pools of water that are blue and gray. Marathon farm soils bang with heavy metal. Derelict Aerosmith residents beg to settle. Eyes closed, lungs burning up, breathing with the devil. No insurance, even breathing is a risk. And when doctors dismiss, label ridiculous, we get pissed. One part bionic, the illness part chronic, half supersonic as we breathe these harmonics. Got it? We're like a breath of fresh air, disappear like gentle kiss. So please remember this. We breathe in, we breathe out. We breathe in, asthma, asthma, breathe out, cancer, ah! Breathe in, we breathe out. Ah! That's respiration. Thank you so much for listening. Wow. Thank you, Oalabi. And I didn't know when we did the deep breathing at the beginning that it would connect so nicely with your <laughs> spoken word. Uh, I would love to get a copy of that. I don't know if you have that posted on your on your uh, website, but it's wonderful. And you're muted. Thank you. I'll uh, put a link where people can hear a copy of it. Wonderful. Thank you so much. And um, now we're gonna do um, some question and answers. And I believe that I'm hoping that there have been questions and answers um, put in the chat um, as we've gone along. 
And I just, I know there were some, when, when folks registered, there were some questions. So I'm gonna um, just ask a couple of those that were are raised um, prior to today, because I think there were you know, a couple of really important, well, several important questions, and then we'll get to the ones in the chat. Um, so I wanted to start, and I'll just leave it to, to you all panelists to decide how, you know, who wants to answer this. Um, who are your allies in your work? And what recommendations do you have for building more allies? So whoever would like to answer that. Um, I guess I could go. So um, there is a really good, well, one of the things or actions that I took uh, last year was um, advocating for a young uh, black autistic man that was falsely accused of a crime uh, that you know we believe he didn't uh, commit and he was facing you know double charges in both cities it was it was really a big uh, mess so but I would the reason why I brought that up is, that we were uh, wars on wheels we were uh, contacted by a great group called a uh, moratorium now um and his name is uh mike shade and so uh mike shade has been in uh the you know advocate out uh, been an ally to the disability community since the 1980s but he was the first person that have received a call about this young man um and so and he could have took it on and his organization and advocated, but he made a point to reach out to Lisa from Wars on Wales and myself. And then, you know, we got involved and she he also, also reached out to, you know, Detroit Display Power, who also, you know, came and got involved. And so um that is an example of an ally. You know, when you see issues that affect the disability community, you know, they come and get us to be part of that movement. Uh, yeah, so I, I would agree with you, but I would also say that um, allies don't just have to be disability-based organizations as uh, all I'll be pointing out. So some allies are, oh, I had it in my mind, but it came out. They're based at CAS Commons. They're the, yeah, they're the environmental justice group that is based in CAS Commons. Oh, Alabin, can you help me? Because the name just went out of my mind. So cool. Is that EMIAC? Yes, EMIAC. They're allies. So don't just look. Um, we don't just look to ally ourselves with other disability-based organizations. There are organizations like Transform and Power Fund, Detroit People's Platform, Motor City Freedom Riders. There are so many organizations that focus on transit, housing, um, economic justice, uh, EJAM comes to mind. Economic Justice Alliance of Michigan comes to mind. These are all organizations that fight for equity in all areas of life, which, as we pointed out here, is what disability justice is all about, weaving the normalcy of human condition into every aspect of life. Thanks, Jamie. Anyone else want to add anything on allies? I think um, I want to give a shout out to um, Allied Media Projects um, and the Love Building and the Love Campus. Um, they're doing a new building that's going to be launched later this year, and they've had um, a whole process. Um, Tamika has been part of it, um, Tara Ne Fazelli, Annie Gregorian, others have been part of it um, alongside thinking of it similar to community benefits. So in terms of a new building, engaging in people in these conversations. Um, and so if you are with an organization and you have space, you know, bringing people in and having conversations about what accessibility means, having conversations about what accessibility looks like, 
um, and then putting the resources behind it to implement, you know, and what we said is, you know, you can't do everything. You know, if we tell you 15 things, maybe the first year you do five of them, but the fact that you had those conversations and put some resources towards it and you wrote them down. So you're like, here's our 15 ideas, you know, is a great step. Um, I, I don't think anybody here expects every organization well, maybe Wayne State, you got a lot of money at Wayne State, but you don't expect every group to do everything. But I think people with disabilities, you can tell when somebody's doing something genuinely and when they're doing nothing. You know, again, this is a great segue into one of the questions I see here in the chat. Um, what do you think Wayne State University's, Detroit's, and Michigan's commitment? to accessibility for people, students with disabilities is with regard to the built environment. And then it says a full compliance to the Architectural Barriers Act standards 2015 is even a social political goal. Implementation of universal design seems very far off in the future. So I guess the question is, what do you think of Wayne State, Detroit's, Michigan's commitment to accessibility for people with disabilities with regard to the built environment? Uh, this, this is Jamie. It's, it's so interesting that this question happened because I was just on a, a webinar with Detroit Wayne Integrated Health Network and they were talking about housing. So I think, first of all, I want to say that the ADA and the building codes are only the bare minimum, right? This is, these standards were created in 1990 and 2010. Technology and life has evolved so much since that time. So um, look to go beyond just mere ADA compliance or ABA compliance. Look to accessibility as uh, Oalabi said. I would be remiss. So there's an organization that uh black food security network they're building a market they brought disability activists in to talk about what they wanted to see in the plans in terms of parking in terms of you know everything that can make it accessible for folks to come in so first of all look at that as the basement what do I think about what we've done? I think we can do better. I think if I'm speaking just as a person with a disability, not as an affiliate of the city, this is just my opinion. I think the attention to housing and our communities for individuals with disabilities, all disabilities is deplorable. A 5% set aside nowhere nowhere near makes up for the need and that's and you're when you do that not only are you relegating people to inaccessible housing to live in with their families but in a sense you're further segregating it and isolating people because you're telling them who they can be friends with who they can love because if i have to choose between where I can afford to live and what's accessible to my mate, to my best friend, to the children I might have. If I want to age in place, my parent or my loved one becomes disabled. You're putting me in a horrible position. So we should really be moving towards creating affordable all affordable housing at base universally designed so that it can be built from there i think a friend of mine a collaborator um bridget quinn uh recently did a facebook post i believe the city of warren they her community center has these signs that say something like I forgot exactly how it puts, but like you cannot have multiple bags with clothing and be in this community center. And basically that's a thing to exclude homeless people. Like you can't, you know, homeless people be having multiple bags and, you know, and so 
this thing about accessibility, you know, if you're afraid the police are going to be caught on you because you're a black man, you know, that's an accessibility thing. And that's a thing of normalcy. Like, oh, you're not normal. You don't fit. You know, if the police are caught or if like, oh, you're too poor, you don't belong here. You know, a lot of the homelessness, the houselessness, it intersects sometimes with disability, you know, many different times. But people can dismiss that and say, oh, no, that's just the homeless people, you know. And so there's a lot of these intersections and a lot of these exclusions that are taking place. You know what I'm saying? The whole notion of called who belongs and who doesn't belong, um, which may not have the disabled label. Um, but when we look at disability justice in this intersectional way, um, we see that there are all these different policies. Like there's statistics, I don't have them in front of me, that say a high percentage of uh, people, Africans, Black folks who are killed by police have disabilities. You know, many times people are having mental health crises or having these things and they, you know, they're not being normal. They're being loud. They're being disruptive, et cetera, et cetera. And the police come violently and kill them, you know, and in these different types of things, this type of societal exclusion is affecting folks with disability. It's a very form of violence and exclusion, even if it does not have the disability word on it. I had, there are quite a few questions here, so I'm gonna try my best to get through as many as I can. Um, there was one, um, what are some ways that I can become involved in disability justice in my area? I don't know if my area is Detroit or not, but anyone wanna take a stab at that one? I see a few questions in the chat about people who want support. Oh, oh, Alabi, before before you go to that, I, I saw Jamie, you were on mute. It looked like you were gonna give an answer to that, but then we'll go to you after. Okay, I was going to say, if your area is Detroit and you're a student at Wayne State, I believe the dean talked about the students in Wayne State building this collective in the social work school. So that would be an excellent place to start. There's also organizations like Warriors on Wheels, a metropolitan Detroit, um, there is Detroit Disability Power. There are all kinds of organizations. And if you belong to a social justice organization, open it up, make your meeting places accessible. That's a way to ally yourself with the disability justice movement right there. That's easy. Yeah, definitely. I was going to second that, you know, different uh, organizations. You can, you know, Google, uh, you know, us and and um, definitely be connected. Great. Thanks. Um, oh, Lobby, it sounded like you were looking at some of the questions that we have in our chat here. Did you want to uh, make a comment on that? Yes, um, it seemed like a, a number of questions are about wanting support. Um, and I think that that's a, the organizations looking up Warriors on Wheels, looking up the organizations here on the panel um, and community care circles would be another one to look up, um, which is um, specifically many folks who may not have other places to get in to fit in. Um, and so it may start with going off campus to getting that support and then, like Jamie said, bringing that energy back um, to impact your campus. Thank you. Um, this is a question. There were two questions to Hala specifically. One was if you could please um, ex define praxis. Yes. Um, so I forgot the name of the person who coined it. So my apologies. But as I understood it, praxis is basically the process of self-reflection and change. So basically, if you have like this bias or this idea about a certain concept or a certain topic, um, like you go into it thinking, oh, you know, this is my view on a certain thing. But then 
you you're open to learning opportunities and change and then you kind of like you know condition yourself to kind of look at your own internalized biases and dig deep that's basically what praxis is letting go basically letting go of your internalized biases and reflecting on them and um you know as far as like my education and social work goes this is like something that we cover extensively um we we always um you know at the end of the day even if like we're doing a clinical assignment or anything like that we always like reflect on it or the professors always have like certain questions about like how we can reflect on our own internalized biases and how we can improve our um ideas for our practice uh, down the line great thank you and then this one was too hollow but all feel free to to respond to this um i'm curious as to your thoughts on the medical model of disability especially as it is applied more in healthcare than the social model i think the focus yes. on the medical aspect over the social environmental aspects diverts attention from the issues that impact our health and quality of life Yes. So I think one thing that healthcare professionals, well, my humble recommendation, again, as a student of social work, I'm not very far in my social work education. So by like no means am I like an expert. I, I just want to clarify that. But from what I've learned so far, I think the medical model um, is, a, is a kind of disservice um, to people because it doesn't really consider um the social and and psycho and you know um psychological and spiritual aspects of a person's um health um it, it's very much focused it's very narrow it's very much focused on like just you know alleviating you know one aspect of illness or kind of curing one aspect of illness rather than thinking about you know the environmental context and the geographic context and the the just you know the person's spiritual outlook and cultural outlook and and cultural belief like without considering all of these it just focuses on you know curing a certain illness so i think the um a more comprehensive focus would focus on the social determinants of health as well as the biological um aspect of it so for example um one one case study that we reviewed uh, in my course was um, about this um, primary care physician who had asked the patient, you know, she was having um, migraines and things like that. So he had asked his patient, um, do you have mold in your house? Or like, you know, what is your living space look like? You know, what is, you know, do you have like transportation and adequate access to like water in your house? And she, and she replied no so like having that interprofessional interconnectedness like having community health workers and social workers intervene in addition to um in addition to primary uh care physicians will really help alleviate a lot of the health disparities that many people face um particularly um people of marginalized backgrounds and, and people of different disabilities I hope that answers the question. Yes, that was great, Paula. Thank you. Does anyone else want to add anything to Paula's answer? Uh, I was going to ask you, Sharon, if you could repeat the question. Sure. It was, let me go back up there. It was about her thoughts on the medical model versus a more social model, and that especially in healthcare, there seems to be more of that medical model. Okay. You see that that map? Yeah, just the thoughts on the medical model of disability. Uh, okay. So first, I want to say that I would agree with Hala, and I would also uh, challenge folks because disability is can be a secondary condition to health. It doesn't have to mean that your health is poor. A person with cerebral palsy—that's an incident that happens at birth and then the person's physical health evolves from there. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. the idea of health can persist mm -hmm. with or without the disability. Mm -hmm. um, so you you really do your patients a disservice if you just follow the medical model because 
in a medical model of disability, as Hala said, you're not considering my any of the social determinants of health with our important and environmentally how I can move about and how I can access what I need to survive ultimately can create or destroy my health. Yeah. 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 And I really like want to build on Jamie's point because again, like disability, like I, I think you brought up a crucial point, Jamie, and that disability does not necessarily mean illness. You get what I'm saying? So it's just like, it might be a condition that we just have to navigate and that, you know, and that like, it's okay if it can't be cured. If, you know, if we're okay navigating it, it's not necessarily something to be cured. Like I, you know, come from an environment where, you know, people constantly told me, oh, I hope you can walk one day. I hope this, I hope that. And I know that comes from good intentions, but honestly, I don't know where I'd be without my disability. My disability informs so much of my approach to social work and so much of who I am. So I really don't see my disability as something to be cured from. I see it as like, okay, it comes with a certain obstacle, but it does, it does not define me as a person. And it does not like mean that I have inadequate health. It just means that I'm navigating the world or a world that wasn't necessarily built for people with disabilities. So I think that societal perception is super important. And this is such an interesting conversation. I think in a way, this question feels timely to ask now, what, what do you do to advocate for those with invisible disabilities? So again, with that medical model in mind, invisibilities, invisible disabilities don't always fit with that model. So I'm just curious what, what you think about um, how to advocate for people with invisible disabilities and how the medical model may or may not fit in with that. Uh, if I, you want to go, Tamika? Yeah, I, yeah, I was thinking that with, um, with the visible disabilities, I think we have to uh, make, you know, advocate, continuously advocate and educate, you know, the community that a visible disability is a disability. It's not, you know, um, seeing as whole, like I said before, that they're faking it or it's not real or that, you know, because disability is like, it's on the spectrum. Uh, based on the Americans with Disabilities Act, the, uh, disability is anything that will uh, affect a major part of somebody's life that they would need assistance. So some people, you know, who have a, a, a disability, sometimes they might have to, you know, have to use a wheelchair, but sometimes they don't have to use a wheelchair on other days. And so it's, I see it as kind of like a spectrum, you know, it's not, disability isn't always, like I said, something physical is invisible. I think they, there needs to be a lot of education mm -hmm. um, in, in society, but it also, you know, for uh, people who have an invisible, invisible disabilities to recognize themselves that this, this mm -hmm. disability, they are, they do have a disability. Because sometimes they say, well, I'm mm -hmm. not like that. So I don't really mm -hmm. have a disability. So they kind of second guess mm -hmm. themselves. So it's just really teaching pride and teaching, educating people mm -hmm. who have a disabilities that you do have mm -hmm. one, you have a right to access like everybody mm -hmm. else have, and you should, mm -hmm. you know, fight to get what you what you need. And don't make people feel make you know, make you feel like or gaslight you that you don't have mm -hmm. a disability because you do. Thank you, Tamika. I was I was uh gonna say a lot of the same things. I was going to go back to what I said at the beginning of the hour when I talked about disability really being a culture. It has its origin and how mm -hmm. my body with my cerebral palsy interacts with the world around me. So how does my son's mind with his ADHD and anxiety interact with the world around him? People can't see it unless he's having, he may be having that up bad day, then people can see it, but they can't. So we have to start educating people that disability 
is when my diagnosis meets the world around me. It doesn't automatically make me be discriminated against because I say I'm a part of this community or I'm a part of this culture. And I think education is first. Understanding that ableism exists in the world. Teaching people that I don't have to look a certain way to need assistance or need accommodation. Mm. Me telling you that I need assistance or need accommodation should be good enough. That's the first step in advocacy, educating, uh, teaching, uh, facilitating pride by giving information and empowering folks to live in their bodies truly the way that they experience in their lives. Uh, one of my pet peeves in life is that people say disability or mental illness. And, and the Americans with Disabilities Act, mental health, mental health um, impairments, disorders, uh, addiction, disorder, all those things are considered under the moniker of disability. So that's the federal definition. So why separate it out? You are a part of a larger community where you can find love, where you can find uh, support, where you can find everything that you need to live your best life. That's where it starts. It starts with the person that has the invisible disability recognizing that they have value in their skin and with their experiences. Jamie, I think this is a nice um, transition into this. It wasn't a question, but it, to talk about the values that guide the disability justice movement. And I think you were hitting on some right there. I don't know if you want to add to any, anything you just said and others, if you want to talk about the values you see in the disability right. justice, justice movement. So I'm going to go to my my two favorites, which Tamika talked about them earlier. So the idea of interdependence, meaning um, I don't just need to depend on myself, but the idea of normalizing support and assistance, that's my main favorite one. And the other one is everybody has value. That goes back to the idea of normalizing contribution, not based on production but if i bring what i can and you bring what you can then we can do it like i can't build a house by myself maybe somebody can do the roof and maybe i can hammer a nail in in, in the floor but we're still building the house so those are my favorite too and i'll leave it to my colleagues to add more You guys can feel free to chime in. I mean, that was so perfectly said, Jamie, that I don't think I don't think I could like say anything more to make it more perfect. Like that was profound. But I will say that if you want to learn more, a great place to find those principles is at Sins Invalid. So that's S I N S I N V A I L D. And then, uh, Sharon, while we're on this subject of the principles, I saw a question about where a person could learn ASL. And I think that's a perfect example of uh, the disability principles at play. So Wayne County Community College, I believe, offers ASL courses. Um, at their downtown east side and northwest campuses. I don't know where they're at, but I know that they offer them. Um, Oklahoma State University, they have a school for the deaf. They offer online self-directed classes. I myself am uh, taking those classes, and they're very intuitive. Thanks, Jamie. And I, and I realized in the chat there, and I apologize, there may be some specific questions that we um, may not get to. And hopefully we can figure out a way to get the questions 
so that um, maybe they could be answered after today's event. There was a comment here um, that I thought might be just as a, as a kind of a closing, um, some closing remarks from you all, that um, the comment was, I think education, the education within social work needs to have more emphasis on disability. The disability community is the largest minority yet. There is very little education within social work programs. At least that was my experience for both my undergraduate and graduate program. Any thoughts on the ways school social work, and I'm not as, you know, I know there is a certificate program in the school social work related to disability studies, but thoughts on ways to, in, to include more um, education or emphasis on disability. And I don't know if that's others' experience as well. I'm gonna repeat myself and say, bring folks, instructors, deans that are listening, follow uh, this example, have seminars and make it, a, make it mandatory. I think people have to take diversity, equity, and inclusion classes. Often disability is left out of that conversation or it's a very narrow, conversation within uh, DEI spaces, increase those conversations and bring people to the table. Classes automatically have individuals who are uh, black, white, uh, of Arabic descent, of mm -hmm. um, Latino descent. They have them uh, intrinsically in the class presence mm -hmm. matters have the conversation mm -hmm. amongst your students mm -hmm. because everybody's there and everybody brings a perspective so i don't think you have to necessarily wait for it to be a curriculum have the mm -hmm. conversations in class if it's not introduced raise your hand and introduce it that's one way to fight systemic ableism yeah yeah, I agree, Jamie. Um, like, I noticed that throughout my undergraduate experience and now through my graduate experience, I don't know if like down the road I'll find like more disability specific classes, but more often than not, like I see classes like, you know, covering, um, you know, topics about, you know, uh, African American and, and Black identity and LGBTQ identity and, you know, a religious, you know, religious, uh, you know, comparison and, and whatnot, but I never see anything like a class dedicated to disability justice in general. So, and I, I do bring it into a lot of like my academic papers and, you know, my academic discourses about like the value of intersectionality for, you know, people with disabilities, but it's never like at the center. So like, from my experiences, like I never see like disability at the center of a class. So, you know, just designing more courses and having more like awareness on how to implement these courses and in, in a way that's just and uses inclusive and accessible language, I think would be really cool. Like just, just kind of incorporating disability. Like I'm not saying like making full blown courses about you know, people just step by step adding disability into the discourse. And thank you so much. And I'm going to I'm just looking at the time now. So I want to make sure that we end on time. Um, but so School of Social Work at, you know, whether at Wayne State or other universities that might be listening, you know, they've been given some really good suggestions and other departments, too, not limited to social work. So I think those are really good you know, some concrete suggestions of some, some things that you can do today. So I just want to thank our panelists, Olabi, Tamika, Jamie, Hala. I am honored and humbled to have worked with you today. I've learned so much. Um, I'm going to pass it off now to Damon Creighton, Creighton Jr., who is a current BSW student. He's the vice president of the WSU Association of Black Social Workers and a social work peer support peer mentor. He is also the vice president of the Brotherhood 
a WSU student organization aimed at providing academic, social, and emotional support to African American males in higher education. So Damon, I am gonna have you take it away and provide some closing remarks. And thanks so much. Absolutely. Hello, everyone. Um, like she said, my name is Damon Creighton Jr. Um, I'm a BSW senior. Um, and I also have a invisible disability. Um, I have, I was diagnosed with epilepsy when I turned 13. Um, but oh, for the sake of a description, um, I'm an African American male wearing a dark blue um, polo with a wonderful, oh, this way, wonderful Game of Thrones poster with a nice little mirror action going on. Um, but yeah, I, you know, it was really, it's really an honor just to be able to speak among such incredible um, advocates and people who are seeking justice for um, those with disabilities. Um, and there are so many excellent points made today. And I took some notes on a few points that I really wanted to highlight. And the first one I really wanted to speak on was having that seat at the table. Um, often we see those decisions made on behalf of what we think somebody with a disability would want. But in reality, having those people at that table for those decisions or um, at the table to make those decisions is so impactful. And that takes it into my point of, um, I can't remember who made it, but the point of having us not just participate in um, just a series just for disability. While it is very important, it is an aspect of our identity, but there's so many levels and um, amazing characteristics of our different identities that we can speak on so many different things. Like, like for me, for example, like, yes, I have a disability, but um, as you heard from some of the other things I do, I, I advocate for so many different Black issues or um, I often take place in a lot of different LGBTQ discourses. Um, there's so many aspects to all people with disabilities and without disabilities that really taking advantage of your multifaceted um, characteristics. And I wanna transition into um, the validation and some of the, the uh, excuse me, internalized ableism. Um, because that's something that I dealt with for so long. There was such a period when I was going through high school when I barely wanted to tell people I had it because I was so ashamed that it was a part of my identity that I really let it take over who I was. And it really took me meeting some very important people and really finding myself to realize that it's really such a strength and it has really shaped me into who I am and has made me really like value and take privilege in the life that I have had and the things that I do have and take the knowledge that I've grown over the years to really pass it on to the next generation that are coming up. And through social work, I think we really can just take those times through the curriculum and you know how they're talking about how um, potentially getting more disability knowledge in our curriculum because there is like the diversity in the oppression class where we talk about all different aspects and disability is something that is often minimized or not really spoken about when in reality that's such a huge population of who we'll work with um, going into once you get out of school. Like for me, like I'm interested on the micro, on the micro level. So I would be wanting to do clinical with children and adolescents. And often I would come across many who would have disabilities and learning about some of that stuff in school would be such an incredible advantage to um, be such a, a great resource to them to make them really feel like you understand them, whether you have a disability or not, having that information. Because really for me, when I met somebody with epilepsy and they were kind of telling me their experiences, it made me feel like I 
wasn't alone and I felt understood for the first time in my life because having that invisible disability, I had often been kind of cast aside or told that it wasn't real or it wasn't affecting how I really was. But in reality, um, it was a fight, but all in all, um, really just being able to advocate and being understanding and being loving to all people is really what it comes down to. So um, overall, thank you so much for um, allowing me to speak on this and give these last remarks. And I hope everyone has an incredible rest of their evening and incredible rest of your life if I've never crossed your path again, but um, peace and love. <laughs>